Hello and welcome. This webinar forms part of a series of webinars given by Mayor Brown's Global Employment and Benefits Group on the issues affecting employers who are planning a return to work or who are adjusting to carry on business in the current circumstances. It forms a part of Mayor Brown's 10 Hundred series, providing guidance into the top 10 pivotal issues across various topics that businesses need to be mindful of in the first 100 days of returning to work. Mayor Brown's global COVID-19 response offers insight on and analysis of the virus's impact on business worldwide through the dedicated portal known as Responding to COVID-19, which can be accessed via the Mayor Brown website or by searching covid19.mayorbrown.com. We have designed the webinars so that they can function equally well as either an audio-only broadcast or accessed via a video link. We hope you enjoy the series. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. My name is Nick Robertson. I'm a partner in our employment team at Mayor Brown. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar, which is part of Mayor Brown's new global webinar series in which we'll be focusing on the wide range of issues and risks that need to be addressed by employers around the world when planning a, a safe return to the workplace. The background to this is that Multinational employers are grappling with a whole host of issues and risk when planning to get back to business. And clearly, they're looking at guidance or thinking in one country, which may be able to inform their decision-making in another country. The Employment and Benefits Group webinar series, which I'm about to talk about in a second, is really part of uh, the 10 by 100, um, 10 things to think of during the first 100 days of planning in connection with returning to work and working in the new normal. Clearly, employment law issues are a particularly key issue right now. And the purpose of this webinar and the series of webinars that we'll be doing is to look at five key areas of liability and risk and to highlight some common global themes. And we will look at issues of potential liability and practical tips in minimizing risks and returning to work in subsequent national webinars that we're going to roll out during the month of June, covering each of the jurisdictions um, that we're going to reference in this talk today. Um, and inevitably, our speakers um, today will be drilling deeper into the uh, national issues as the national webinars come around. Um, I'm joined, as I foreshadowed, by a number of my partners today who are going to be involved in those subsequent webinars, and we're sharing speaking duties uh, today. So um, Hong Tran, who will be speaking immediately after me, is talking about risks to employers of employee enforcement action, bringing claims for breach of health and safety duties. Arijan Guri from our Paris office is going to talk on the risk of governmental agencies taking enforcement action against employers for breach of health and safety duties. Guido Zeppenfeld, our senior partner in Frankfurt, is going to talk about some of the privacy issues that need to be considered by employers. Andy Roseman, partner in the Chicago office, is going to pick up other legal risks um, that need to be thought of. Maureen Gorman, partner in Palo Alto in New York um, office, is going to look at some of the issues for benefits and benefit plans raised by the current conditions and potential return to work issues. And last, but very definitely not least, Liz Stern, a partner in the Washington office and head of our global mobility team, is going to talk about global mobility issues employers should be thinking about now. So thank you. And as they say, on with the show. So. I am going to get things underway and talk about the legislative framework and guidance. The starting point is to consider the legal duties in the field of health and safety if you're planning a return to work. Obviously, we're going to assume that the employer in question is not a business which is banned from opening, whether it's a restaurant in the UK or a zoo in California, to take two wildly different examples. But the basic statutory duty in the UK is that the employer has a, an obligation to ensure, as far as reasonably practical, the health and safety at work of all its employees. And this is under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. This is then supplemented by a complicated set of regulations, such as the man Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations, many others dealing with specific aspects of safety. In England and Wales, that is then supplemented by common law, which implies a duty into the contract of employment for the employer to take reasonable care of its employees. And typically, in the UK, enforcement might be by a fine or by an improvement notice. And um, speakers following me will say more about enforcement issues. In Germany, you've got the Workplace Protection Act, which sets out the basic obligations of the employer in relation to workplace health and safety. 
and these in turn are then supplemented by workplace ordinance, which provides regulations about the physical design of workplaces in relation to matters such as ventilation, which is obviously going to be a key issue. There are then a series of ordinances regarding special circumstances of work where there are particular risks, such as handling biological agents or working with PPE. Breaches of legislation can give rise to criminal sanctions and various orders, including the possible closure of a workplace. In France, the French Labour Code sets out a, a general duty on the employer to secure health and safety in work, and it's what's known as a reinforced duty of mean, which means the employer must take all reasonable measures to secure the health and safety of its employees. In addition to this, the Code contains very detailed, specific health and safety rules. The main threat is that the enforcing authorities and trade unions can apply for an injunction to close or prevent a place from opening if there's been a breach of the legislation, and both Amazon and Renault have recently had orders made against them in connection with potential return to work. In Hong Kong, the key piece of legislation is the Occupational Safety and Health Ordinance, which obliges an employer to ensure, as far as reasonably practical, the health and safety at work of all its employees. In practice, this generally requires an employer to carry out a risk assessment to consider ways of mitigating the risks and implementing what it turns up. In terms of COVID-19, there's guidance issued by the Centre for Health Protection, which is part of the Department of Health, on what steps an employer can take. Again, as with the UK, there's also a duty to ensure workplace health and safety, which is an implied term in contracts to employment. The position in the US is, as you would expect it, rather more complicated. First, you've got the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Act, or, depending on the particular state, the analogous state plans which have been approved by the Federal Occupational Safety Administration, OSHA. To take just one example of a state plan, California has its own state plan relating to things like occupational safety and health standards, covering things such as heat exposure, injury and illness prevention programs. So that was firstly. Secondly, there are state and local government directives on matters such as reopening that impose a complex and varied patchwork of conditions precedent to reopening, depending on the type of business that you're looking at. Thirdly, uh, there is guidance from U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and state and local public health authorities. You've also got guidance from Equal Opportunity, the EEOC, and the Food and Drug Administration, and um, looking at things like the accuracy and reliability of COVID-19 testing, amongst other very relevant topics. As I say, it's a particularly complex web for employers. In Brazil, which, as we know, is taking a different approach to the management of the pandemic, as a general rule, the employer must provide a healthy and safe environment for its employees. And the Brazilian Ministry of Economy has several regulatory standards that provide for specific health and safety measures that should be adopted by companies belonging to all sorts of businesses in order to comply with the healthy and safe environment, the general rule requiring for a healthy and safe, healthy and safe environment. Therefore, although there are specific laws for employers on employees' protection, Companies must comply with health and safety general rules, um, and bearing in mind, of course, that those general rules will apply in the sort of grave situation the pandemic creates uh, for employees and employers alike. And most countries, of course, have provided additional guidance specifically in relation to coronavirus, and in some cases, specifically in relation to return to work issues. These will be picked up in the uh, more detailed webinars that, for example, in France, the French Ministry of Labour published guidelines to ensure health and safety of employees in connection with the return to work. In the UK, we had pages and pages of guidance, both as to general principles and specifically in relation to return to work in different types of work locations. And as I say, we'll deal with those in more detail in our local webinar series, because there are some interesting differences in approach between countries in connection with the return to work. I did want to say a few more words about the approach in Brazil, though, because, of course, there's been no lockdown. And so the issue instead is what guidance has been given to employers who are continuing to work through the pandemic. Uh, there are, is only general coronavirus guidance for the population, you know, use of masks, social distancing rules, quarantine obligations, that sort of thing. The government has not established general coronavirus guidance for employers, or though employers do need to follow the, the general rules applicable to the population when it comes to providing a safe workspace for their employees. Certain government agencies have issued instructions to, in relation to certain key areas of industry. So the National Health and Health Surveillance Agency has issued guidance, for example, in relation to airports, and they may well then become applicable to employers who have um, businesses operating in those areas. So that's what I wanted to say about the legislative framework. 
What about risk assessments? Because you hear an awful lot of risk assess about risk assessments in some countries. Well, a number of the countries we've referred to have specific requirements on employers to, to undertake risk assessments, and this will be relevant to employers looking at a return to work. In Germany, the Workplace Protection Act has um, statutory obligations to conduct documented risk assessments, and these can be supplemented by the Workplace Ordinance, which provides for specific risk assessment provisions. The position is similar in the UK. Employers with more than 50 employees and are required to carry out risk assessment, and the government has said, in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, that employers should be publishing these risk assessments on their websites. So clearly, they are going to be there for employees to inspect and hold the employer to account if there are shortcomings. If an employer has fewer than 50 employees, then it doesn't absolutely need to publish it on its website, but it should do so if it is reasonably practicable. In France, the Labour Code requires that employers establish a document assessing risks at the workplace and updated every year or more if required. And the French government has said that it considers that this document needs to be updated with the COVID-19 risks and a prevention plan should, should be drawn up having done that risk assessment. In Brazil, normally companies are obliged to conduct studies on the risks involved in their work environment. And those studies should result in the draft of risk prevention documents, assessing the risk, providing for rules and measures the employers need to adopt in the workplace in order to mitigate those risks and protect employees from them. In the US, employers generally are not required to publish hazard assessment plans as part of reopening. Indeed, closest one comes to a general duty in the US on employers to undertake a risk assessment prior to return to work is in the interim guidance for business and employers issued by the CDC. And this is largely persuasive and obligatory. That said, it's our firm view that good communication with employees is extremely important to reassure a workplace workforce that the employer has been taking all necessary steps, and that in turn is predicated on some form of risk assessment. What about consultation? That's really the third and final theme that I wanted to develop. This becomes apparent. Looking at the health and safety frameworks in the countries which I've touched on, and particularly in the context of return to work, the role played by mandatory collective consultation varies significantly. I've mentioned France already, the need for this consultation, and the failure to take this step can be punished by an injunction preventing the business from reopening. I should certainly imagine that gets the attention of most, if not all, employers. In the UK, collective consultation is required under regulations made under the Health and Safety at Work Act, although it would be rather less likely that injunction would, would follow if uh, those provisions hadn't been strictly complied with. In Germany, too, collective consultation is so much a feature of the uh, industrial regime there, but collective consultation is a key part of the health and safety regime. On the other hand, you've got countries such as the Hong, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Brazil, uh, and the US, where collective consultation just does not feature to anything like the same extent. And there, employers are not expected to go through collective consultation duties um, before planning a return to work. Although there are plenty of arguments why following it on a voluntary basis may have the necessary benefits of inspiring confidence and in turn facilitating a return to work. So now I'm going to hand over to Hong, who's going to talk about the possibility of employee claims against the employer where there has been a breach of health and safety obligations. Thank you, Nick. So. Nick talked about whether any legislation and or guidance covered the area of health and safety uh, in all the jurisdictions uh, we mentioned um, there are. I'm going to look at what an employer's risk exposure is to employee claims for breach of health and safety rules. It will come as no surprise to you that in the UK, France, Germany, Hong Kong, the US and Brazil, an employee will have some avenue of recourse against the employer for failing to take reasonable steps to ensure the workplace health and safety of their employee. So starting with the UK, if an employee is dismissed for raising health and safety concerns or for refusing to return to the workplace due to a reasonable belief that attending work would put them in serious and imminent danger, it could amount to an automatic unfair dismissal under Section 100 of the Employment Rights Act. In addition, any short uh, uh, any action short of dismissal, such as disciplinary action or withholding pay on the grounds, as just mentioned above, uh, could entitle the employee to bring a detriment claim under Section 44 of uh, that Act. For both types of claims, there are no
no qualifying service requirement. In France, the civil liability rules are complex as regards health and safety at work, starting with the right of withdrawal from work. The French Labour Code provides that an employee has the right to withdraw from work if the work situation prevents, uh, presents a serious and imminent danger to his life or health. A danger is serious if it represents a threat to the life or health of the worker. It is imminent if the risk can occur immediately or within a short period of time. It is up to the employee to assess uh, based on his skills, knowledge and experience whether the situation presents a serious and imminent danger to his life or health. The employee does not have to prove that there is danger but must feel potentially threatened by a risk of injury, accident or illness. The danger may be individual or collective. He or she may interpret his or her activities as long as the employer has not put in place the appropriate prevention measures. In the context of COVID-19, a lack of protective measures may be considered as a serious and imminent danger. The government considers that so long as an employer complies with the published guidelines, an employee cannot withdraw from work. In relation to constructive dismissal, should an employer repeatedly refuse to set up basic protective measures, the employee may be entitled to claim constructive dismissal and damages for unfair dismissal. The employer will have to give prior formal notice to the employer to comply with its obligations. What are the damages that can be claimed? Um, if the employee can demonstrate they caught COVID-19 in the course of employment, then they will benefit from the legal protection against dismissal and may claim damages. Generally, the liability of the employer will arise if COVID-19 is an occupational disease. If it is an occupational disease, then the employer, uh, the employee rather, is indemnified by the state. If the contracting of the disease is caused by the gross negligence of the employer, then the state may look to claim back from the employer. Um, turning now to Germany, Hong Kong, US and Brazil, uh, in those countries, the uh, countries and territories, the, uh, an employee may be able to bring a claim against the employer for damages if the employer has been negligent in not providing proper safety, uh, workplace health and safety. In Germany, the employee may also refuse to work and stay at home if there is an unsafe workplace. Here in Hong Kong, if the employee can demonstrate that they caught COVID-19 and suffered an injury by way of an accident arising out of and in the course of employment, then they may claim compensation under the employee's compensation ordinance, which is our workers' compensation uh, regime here. As with France, COVID-19 is not yet classified as an occupational disease in Hong Kong, and so an employee will need to prove causation. An employee may separately bring a claim for negligence against the employer if they can show the employer breached its duty of care to the employee and the employee has suffered loss and damage, which is not too remote. If the employer fails to take reasonable care to ensure the workplace health and safety of the employee, then the employer may also be in breach of the contract of employment. Under the uh, employment ordinance, which is the primary piece of employment legislation here in Hong Kong, if the employee reasonably fears uh, physical danger or, or violence or disease, such as was not contemplated by their contract of employment, expressly or by necessary implication, then the employee may terminate the contract without notice or payment of wages in lieu under the employment ordinance. So that's looking at what an employer's risk exposure is to employee claims for breach of health and safety rules. I'm going to hand you over to my partner, Regine Goury, uh, who will talk about criminal exposure now. Thank you, Hong, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about the risk of exposure to enforcement action by governmental authorities. In addition to employees' claim, as Hong just explained, all governments are currently focused on the health and safety rules in respect of COVID-19, and more particularly at the workplace. Many have issued guidelines which employers should be advised to follow, and in all countries covered in this webinar, the employer has a duty to secure the health and safety of its employees. Now, what happens when protective measures put in place by an employer when resuming work at the office are insufficient? Risk associated to such lack of prevention range from control by public health and safety authorities 
to potential closure of the site by a judicial order or worse, to potential public for prosecution and criminal liability. As you can see, when it comes to enforcing health and safety rules, three categories of public authorities may be involved. Administrative authorities, the civil judge, or the public prosecutor and the criminal judge. In respect of administrative authorities, in all countries covered by this webinar, such authorities are controlling compliance with health and safety rules by employer. It can be an authority dedicated to health and safety regulation, such as the health and safety executive in the UK, the occupational safety officers in Hong Kong, or the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, in the US. It can also be authorities having a wider scope of competence, such as the Labour Inspectorate in France. All authorities have similar powers. They can undertake inspection of workplace and issue improvement notices, requiring the employee to take action to remedy an identified risk. There are nonetheless some countries' specificities. In respect of the possibility to order the closure of a site, the powers of administrative authorities are not quite the same in each country. In the UK, the Health and Safety Executive can issue prohibition notices directing that an activity should not be carried on by a person until it has been remedied to the risk. In Germany, the local or regional occupational health and safety authorities can directly order site closure, and this is also possible in Brazil in case of a repeated breach. In Hong Kong, the Commissioner for Labor can issue suspension notices against workplace activity that create an imminent danger to employees. In France, the Labour Inspectorate has also the power to order a site closure, but in very limited circumstances, such as a dangerous exposure to chemical substances. In other circumstances, the Labour Inspectorate can only refer the case to the judge who has authority to order a site closure. Except in the UK and in Hong Kong, Administrative authorities also have the power to impose penalties, but the amount may greatly vary by country. In France, in case of repeated breach, the Ministry of Labour can levy administrative penalties up to 2,000 euros per employee, and in Germany, it can be as high as 20,000 euros in overall. In the US, the financial risk is higher. The penalties that OSHA may impose will vary depending on the factors like the severity of the offense and the employer's prior safety record. There can be violations considered as other than serious with potentially no monetary penalty or a limited one or violations considered as serious with medium-sized penalties and the strongest violation considered as willful or repeated violation. In that case, the penalty will be as high as approximately $135,000 per violation. Finally, a UK specificity should be dotted. The Health and Safety Authority can also publish the company's name on a public register using the method of name and shame. As we have just seen, whereas in some countries such as Germany and Hong Kong, health and safety authorities have full powers to order a site closure or suspension of activity. In other countries, this power is given to the judge, usually in summary proceedings. Judge also have the power to issue injunctive orders to comply with health and safety rules, possibly with a daily penalty. 
This is the case in France, where two cases involving large companies have been recently reported in the press. One concerns Amazon, which was ordered to limit its activities to essential ones and comply with health and safety rules. The other one concerns Renault, for which a site was closed up and until the Social and Economic Committee had been properly informed and consulted on health and safety measures. These claims were initiated by unions that an employee or the labor inspectorate could also bring such claims. Brazilian judges have the same powers. In the US, if a workplace poses an imminent danger to the employee's life or physical integrity, the OSHA can request a federal court to issue an injunction to restrain any work condition. And federal courts have broad powers in this respect. Employees, workers' rights groups, and or unions may also file lawsuits seeking to obtain injunction to improve safety conditions. In at least one of such lawsuits during the COVID-19 pandemic, a federal court in Missouri recently dismissed such a lawsuit on the ground that OSHA is better positioned to make this determination than the court. In the, US, in the UK, courts have in theory the power to issue an injunction or a prohibition order to restrict opening of premises until a serious risk to health and safety has been corrected. However, this is exceptional in the UK and difficult to see it happening in the context of the coronavirus pandemic unless the breach is particularly blatant, such as a significant overcrowding of employees in an office with no regard to social distancing. This hypothesis of overcrowded office with no social distancing leads us directly to the last risk an employer may face, that is, criminal liability. In all countries covered by the webinar, Breach of health and safety rules is considered as an offense and fines may be ordered by courts as well as imprisonment sentence may be ordered in some cases. The liability concerns both the company and the CEO of the company and it usually requires an intentional offense, knowingly committed the offense. However, in the UK, such breaches are strictly liability officers. This means that there is no need to prove the employer intended it to happen or show negligence. The fact that the employer caused it to happen is sufficient. Sanctions also greatly vary by country and depend on the seriousness of the injury. Just to give you a sense of the sanctions, in the UK, there is no cap for fines, but no imprisonment. In France, the maximum is a fine of €3,750 per employee and no imprisonment sentence. In Germany, it can be as high as a one-year imprisonment sentence in very serious cases. In Hong Kong, fines are between 200,000 Hong Kong dollars and 500,000 Hong Kong dollars and an imprisonment between six months and 12 months can be ordered. In the US, criminal charges are less common than civil fines and penalties. However, when a violation of health and safety rules results in the death of an employee, the employer may be criminally prosecuted. A convention may result in imprisonment for up to six months and or a fine of up to 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. Aside from sanctions specifically applicable to breaches of health and safety rules, when an employee is severely, severely injured or dies, other criminal charges may apply, such as endangerment of life or manslaughter. Depending on the country, courts 
are either reluctant to follow this route or, on the contrary, accept it. It can be considered that where sanctions for breach of health and safety rules are law, courts tend to accept more easily general criminal charges and vice versa. This is the case in the UK, where, as we have seen, fines are with no cap and correlatively, prosecution of any kind is not a regular occurrence. In Hong Kong, prosecution is also not common. In the US, state prosecutors have the ability to file criminal charges using a broader array of criminal charges, including both misdemeanors and felonies, although such, such criminal charges usually are reserved for severe incidents such as workplace fatalities. The maximum imprisonment sentence is of one year. In Germany, in several cases, severe cases, employers may run the risk of being charged with negligent bodily injury or homicide. The risk would be of a one-year imprisonment. In France, because of the relatively low fines, criminal charges are more fre frequent, and this is at the moment a point of concern for employers who take the risk to resume work at the office. Charges can be for endangerment of life or manslaughter. It should be noted that both the company and the legal representatives of the company can be liable. In both, in the worst case scenario, the CEO can incur a five year imprisonment. Obviously, if, um, it's a company, there is no imprisonment, but only higher fines. In Brazil as well, charges for homicide, bodily injury, or direct or imminent danger may apply. Imprisonment sentences, depending on the seriousness of the case, range between one year in most cases, and maybe as high as eight or 12 years imprisonment sentence. This is all I wanted to present you briefly about enforcement measures. Thank you for listening. I will then pass on to my partner, Kido Seppenfeld, who will present you data privacy issues. Thanks, Regine. As my colleagues have already explained, ensuring workplace health and safety is the key obligation of employers that are in the process of gradually going back to business after COVID-19 lockdowns across the globe. As always, focusing on one key obligation can give rise to other legal problems. Employers need to take a step back, identifying the intricacies of the predominant health and safety focus, evaluating and balancing the inherent legal risks. In other words, ensuring maximum workplace safety in the light of the pandemic may well create issues in respect of other employee protective rights. In that context, one of the areas employers need to be aware of is employee privacy. Stating the obvious, minimizing the health and safety risks at the workplace would ideally require maximum transparency of the physical or medical condition, as well as the infection risk of each individual employee entering the work premises or office. It is important to note that such transparency is restricted by privacy rules and regulations in Asia, the Americas, and of course, in Europe. Measures such as temperature testing, health screenings, enhanced reporting obligations or employee questionnaires regarding respiratory symptoms, pre-existing medical conditions or social contacts certainly can be said to be useful components of any employer's workplace health and safety concept in a COVID-19 environment. However, even in the extraordinary circumstances of a pandemic, across the globe, employers must draw their attention to being compliant with national employee privacy regimes. Avoiding pitfalls here is imperative as the potential risk exposure can be significant. This is an extremely relevant issue since the information gathered in connection with all of these measures qualifies as personal data and in most cases as particularly sensitive individual health data that enjoys special legal protection. This is the legal position in Brazil, for example, where the general principles of national labor law protect the employee's privacy rights. Detailed standards on the collection and processing of personal health data 
form part of the current Brazilian draft legislation, which is expected to enter into force not before August this year. However, based on recent case law, employers in Brazil already are strongly advised to ensure full compliance with this draft piece of legislation, even though this is not formally enacted as of today. The provisions of the draft privacy legislation already serve as the basis for inquiries and investigations done by Brazilian authorities. Since there is no official lockdown in Brazil, special guidance on employee data protection in connection with going back to work is unfortunately not available to date. In the US, both federal and state laws are to be adhered to. Guidance is available under federal law requiring that temperature test results and health screening answers must be kept confidential and separate from personnel files. Employers must also take into account their statutory obligations under the relevant state law. For example, temperature testing may trigger notice requirements under the California Consumer Privacy Act. Other statutes, like the Illinois Personal Information Privacy Act, can come into play as well. Maintaining privacy of infected employees and those suspected of having the virus is important. Employers should not disclose the name of an employee who tests positive to co-workers, though employers are permitted, and in some cases even required to report the name of an employee who tests positive to public health agencies. In Hong Kong, employers need to comply with the provisions of the Personal Data Privacy Ordinance on collection, use, and handling of personal data. A breach of the ordinance's rules can give rise to an investigation by the Privacy Commissioner and potential enforcement notices. The Hong Kong Privacy Commissioner has issued guidelines for employers and employees in connection with COVID-19. These specific guidelines address measures taken by the employer to control the spread of the disease at the workplace or in the wider community, such as the collection of temperature measurements or other employee health data. According to the Commissioner, these measures can be justified as long as the collection and processing of employees' personal data is specifically related and used for the purpose of public health. In addition, the general principles of Hong Kong privacy, privacy law must be adhered to, such as minimization, purpose specification, and use limitation for employee data. Finally, in the UK, France, and Germany, Employers fighting for workplace health and safety in their emergence from lockdown are bound by the notorious EU General Data Protection Regulation, also known as GDPR. In addition, national data protection laws need to be adhered to in dealing with employee personal and health data. Violations of the applicable privacy rules may give rise to significant financial risks for employers in those countries. Under GDPR, Maximum fines issued by the data protection authorities are 20 million euros or up to 4% of an undertaking's total worldwide annual turnover, whichever is higher. The data protection authorities in the UK, France and Germany can also issue enforcement, assessment and information notices. Hence, employers here are strongly advised to take a very close look at the compliance of their business resumption plans with employee data privacy rules, taking into account the specific guidance is issued by the respective local authorities and possibly also in direct alignment with these. In the UK, the Information Commissioner Office has already confirmed that it will take a pragmatic approach to enforcement in the light of the pandemic. For example, it has issued guidance on workplace testing, which confirms that employers can disclose to colleagues that an employee has contracted COVID-19, provided that such disclosure follows the general data protection principles. The French Data Protection Authorities has also issued guidance in relation to the pandemic, which covers temperature testing, sickness questionnaires, the disclosure of infection cases, and further measures to ensure workplace and health safety. Likewise, in Germany, guidance of the Federal Data Protection Commissioner regarding the processing of personal data by employers in connection with the corona pandemic is available. Surprisingly enough, the German Commissioner also signals a rather pragmatic approach to those assessment, to the assessment of legitimacy of the collection of employee data, including health data, for purposes of controlling the spread of the virus. However, strong emphasis is on adherence with the general data protection principles, such as necessity, legitimacy, purpose specification, data scarcity, transparency, and proportionality. 
Individual measures contemplated by employers in Germany should therefore be wetted in the light of these legal principles. The permissibility of general temperature testing, for instance, is at least questionable in Germany. Finally, for the sake of completeness on Germany, I should also mention that the use or introduction of technical means for monitoring employees, such as temperature testing devices, will require prior consultation with the relevant works council. Ladies and gentlemen, my job for today's webinar was to raise your general awareness to potential privacy risks associated with business resumption in the COVID-19 environment on a global scale. We will certainly take a deeper dive on these particular issues in the local webinars of this series. But for now, that's all I wanted to get to you. Many thanks for listening. I now hand things over to my partner, Andy Rosenman in Chicago. Thanks, Guido. I will briefly address some additional legal risks that employers across the globe should be mindful of as businesses reopen more fully and employees return to the workplace. Starting with the United Kingdom, one risk for employers to be aware of is potential whistleblower claims. It's foreseeable that employees returning to work, regardless of where they are located, will report concerns to employers about health and safety issues, as my colleagues have discussed, especially as employers are adjusting or reconfiguring their workplaces to account for COVID-19. In the UK, if an employee is separated from employment, there is a risk of a whistleblower claim if the reason or principal reason for the employee's dismissal is that he or she has made a protected disclosure. In essence, if the employee is asserting that the employer is in breach of a legal obligation, such as a health and safety obligation, and reasonably believes that the issue is one of public importance, then if the employer dismisses that employee for having raised the issue, then it is potentially liable to an unlimited damages claim for breach of the whistleblowing legislation. A second risk in the UK relates to employees commuting to and from work. The current UK directive is that individuals should only travel to work where it is not reasonably possible for them to work from home. So, employers need to consider carefully whether employees in the UK can work from home, as of course doing so may help to limit the spread of COVID-19 within the workplace. Where it is necessary for employees in the UK to travel to work, employers should be mindful of potential disability discrimination claims if the employer treats an employee less favorably on the ground of a disability under the Equality Act 2020. Such a claim may arise, for example, if an employer dismisses an individual at high risk of contracting COVID-19 for not attending work. In such instances, the employer will need to consider reasonable adjustments in the workplace itself or potentially allowing the employees to work from home. Turning to France now, employers should be sure to update their mandatory documents assessing risks at the workplace, or they may incur civil and or criminal liability. As explained by my colleagues, the Social and Economic Committee should be informed and consulted on this risk assessment and the setting up of the prevention plan. Otherwise, a judge can order the closure of the work site up and until this step has been completed. In order to avoid employees' claims or potential enforcement actions, an employer should bear in mind the following issues. As in the UK, employers should, in France should continue to use work from home whenever possible. Consequently, employers in France asking their employees to go back to their offices should consider their potential liabilities when work from home is an alternative. Going back to work requires setting up a number of protective measures which have been detailed by the French government and guidelines. In order to make sure that such measures are respected by employees, the employer should adapt its internal rules, i.e. the code of conduct, or else it will not be able to enforce and sanction non-compliance with those measures. If an employer in France is considering dismissing an employee because he or she contracts COVID-19, it should bear in mind that sick employees benefit from legal protection, so it is not always possible to dismiss employees on that basis. Assuming that the sickness is not considered work-related, which is an issue that has not yet been resolved in France, an employer may dismiss an employee if his or her COVID-19 sickness causes a major disruption in the company's business and he or she is replaced. But such conditions are very seldom met and some industry-wide collective bargaining agreements provide for a general prohibition of dismissal for a number of months. 
should an employer in France nonetheless decide to dismiss an employee on the ground of sickness, such dismissal would be null and void, and the employee would be entitled to reinstatement or uncapped damages. In Germany, employers hammering out back-to-work concepts for their operations need to give due regard to the extensive rules on mandatory works council consultation. Guido has already mentioned uh, the con consultation requirements with respect to implementing technical means for employee testing or monitoring purposes. However, prior consultation with the Works Council will also be required in a number of other areas that are relevant for employers' business resumption, business resumption plans in light of the pandemic. For example, employers in Germany are generally required to involve their Works Councils when conducting the workplace health and safety risk assessments pursuant to their statutory duties. Works Council consultation also is required in connection with the implementation of specific rules on on-site conduct and the technical, organizational, or personal measures to be put in place in order to minimize the infection risk at the workplace, such as minimum personal distance rules, the obligation to wear personal protective equipment, and the like. Likewise, employee questionnaires on individual infection risks or social contacts are, as a rule, subject to Works Council consultation. German employers need to be aware of the fact that, to the extent internal measures require prior consultation, these measures and rules cannot be implemented or imposed in a binding way without buy-in from the Works Council. Hence, disciplinary enforcement of internal pandemic plans will only be possible if proper consultation has been done beforehand. Compliance with these mandatory consultation requirements needs to be factored into the timeline for employers' back-to-business plans in Germany. Shifting now to Hong Kong, employers need to ensure that they take all reasonably practical steps to ensure the health and safety of employees in the workplace, as my colleagues have noted earlier. Here, too, uh, employers may be liable for unlawful disability discrimination if they treat an employee less favorably on the ground of disability, unless an exception applies. A couple of simple illustrations of potential disability discrimination claims in Hong Kong would be refusing to allow someone who has recovered from COVID-19 back into the workplace or moving them to a segregated part of the office upon their return. Another obstacle to avoid for employers is if their redundancy list is made up of those who have caught COVID-19 or have had to take extensive sick leave and have been less productive as a result. While we believe most employers would not go out of their way to discriminate against employees in these ways, the decisions of managers and human resources should be stress-tested. Similarly, employers in Hong Kong need to manage risk associated with employees who refuse to work with someone who may have caught, but have since recovered from, COVID-19, or who treat them less favorably because of it. Hong Kong employers also need to be mindful of risks associated with refusing requests by employees for flexible working hours without a valid basis to do so. In those circumstances, an employee may have a viable claim for family status discrimination if the reason for the request is to take care of an immediate family member, for example. Briefly turning to Brazil, many of the same risks that we just discussed as to Hong Kong apply with equal force in Brazil. For example, employers in Brazil have a similar obligation to take reasonably practicable steps to ensure the workplace health and safety of employees, including business travel to and from work. Turning lastly to the United States, we will get into more details about legal risks in our upcoming webinar specific to reopening businesses in the U.S., but I will briefly preview some of those issues here. Before I do that, though, one brief footnote to Nick's presentation is on the issue of con collective consultation, an employer may, depending on the provisions of the collective bargaining agreement, have the obligation to bargain with a union here in the U.S. as well. Given how lit litigious the U.S. is, a number of additional risks for employers to consider in the COVID-19 world include wage and hour claims. This may relate to working from home, where an employer has less control over the number of hours that are worked, uh, potential overtime claims associated with such work, as well as waiting time claims in the event 
uh, an employer requires its employees to undergo health screenings, temperature testing, or COVID-19 testing when returning to the actual workplace. An additional uh, area of potential liability relates to leaves of absence. We anticipate an uptick in claims by employees with regard to leaves of absences for serious health conditions related to COVID-19 under the Family and Medical Leave Act, for actual disabilities under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and as uh, many employers know already, a number of states and, and cities in the U.S. have passed legislation related to sick leave or family leave associated with COVID-19. The Families First Coronavirus Response Act is a federal law that applies to employers with fewer than 500 employees. And some states like New York have passed legislation related to sick leave that applies to employers of all sizes. And we anticipate there will be claims like this as well. Another area of potential liability in the US is discrimination. Age and disability discrimination claims are likely uh, a risk for employers who decide to bring back younger employees who they deem healthier at the expense of older employees. Um, and of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act protects perceived disability discrimination, not just those employees with actual disabilities. As Hong mentioned earlier, there are potential negligence and tort claims. And one example beyond that, which might be brought by an employee himself or herself, is in the event that an employee contracts COVID-19 in the workplace and infects others in his or her family, there may be third-party claims brought by those inf infected individuals against the employer based on negligence or other tort claims. Finally, as with the UK, there are potential whistleblower claims. As an agency within the Department of Labor, OSHA has a statutory and regulatory scheme and uh, there are a variety of whistleblower claims that can be brought in the U.S. under state statutes, under common law, and under certain federal statutes as well. So now I will turn things over to our partner, Maureen Gorman, for a discussion of employee benefits issues. Thanks, Andy. I'm speaking today about benefit issues in the age of COVID. I wanted to start by observing that there is a good deal of variation among countries in the delivery and financing of retirement and health benefits. Those benefits may be delivered by government system or employer-provided arrangements or by personal savings or the purchase of individual insurance. In almost all countries, the reality is that there is a combination of these components. It's the relative size of each of these components that varies a good deal from country to country. Our focus today is on issues of particular relevance to retirement benefits and medical coverage provided as part of the employment relationship. In countries in which benefits are employer provided, there have been a variety of initiatives related to COVID-19. Employers going back to business may need to consider modifying the terms and or operation of their benefit programs in light of these initiatives, as well as in light of the changed economy and potentially changed workforce. I think that there's some common principles that employers in all countries may apply in making decisions about their employee benefit programs. First is they need to attract talent and they need to offer the right combination of wages and benefits to employees in the labor market in which they're competing. Second is cost containment and this uh, principle I think is of paramount importance to employers in the current economic situation. And when I refer to cash, cost containment, we're referring to both cash and accounting issues. Sound retirement policy and the provision of adequate health care, of course, are another principle that we hope employers are observing. And with respect to sound retirement policy, for example, there may be competing factors like balancing the need to provide for current employee cash needs against preserving long-term retirement assets. A fourth principle is compliance. It's not easy to comply with all the requirements in the different jurisdictions, but it's an important risk mitigation tool in order to forestall government investigations, fines, penalties, and participant lawsuits. So starting with retirement plans, as I mentioned, cost containment is a very important factor for employers getting back to business in the age of COVID. And many employers may be looking to reduce their benefit liabilities, but to do so, they, they have to comply with the laws of the local jurisdiction. In the U.S., one of the most frequently asked questions I'm getting is, can we reduce or eliminate matching contributions to an employee savings plan? Generally, the answer is yes. Employers are free to reduce or eliminate matching contributions on a prospective basis, meaning 
uh, contributions the employee has not yet earned can be eliminated, subject, of course, to the terms and conditions of the plan. It's important to note, though, that in the case of certain plans called Safe Harbor 401k plans, that advance notice requirements have to be satisfied and or the employment employer has to be in an economic uh, loss situation. And in all events, uh, a supplemental notice has to be given within 30 days of the date that the contributions are to be eliminated. With collectively bargained arrangements, there may be further restrictions. In the case of defined benefit plans, employers can amend the plan to reduce accruals provided that they give employees 45 days advance notice. Even pre-COVID, we were seeing a lot of activity in terms of freezing and terminating plans, and I'm not sure there's really been any kind of acceleration in that area on account of COVID, but what we are seeing in the defined benefit area is interest in funding relief. As you know, employers have to fund benefits on an actuarially sound basis, and those contributions can be very burdensome. Helpfully, in the U.S., Congress has enacted relief for employers from the minimum funding rules for 2020. Uh, quarterly minimums and annual minimums that would become due in 2020 may be delayed until Jan 1st of 2021. In the UK, similar to the US, retirement plans are heavily regulated and they're called schemes in the UK. It appears that there's some latitude to reduce contributions to defined contribution schemes, subject, of course, to the terms of the amendment rights under the scheme, and secondly, subject to a requirement that the employee engage in 60 days uh, advanced consultation with employees before uh, implementing the change. The employer doesn't have to get the employee's consent, but it does have to consult with them. Plans in the UK that provide for auto enrollment have certain statutory minimum employer and employee contributions. The employer has to contribute at least 3% of pay and employees 5%. If an employer is currently contributing more than that 3%, it can reduce contributions prospectively down to the three, provided it satisfies the 60-day consultation requirement and you know, that it be permitted to do so under the terms of the plan. The UK pension regulator has also recognized that on account of COVID-19, employees may want to eliminate their contributions to the scheme, and the regulator has counseled employers not to encourage employees to drop out of the plans and where employees do drop out of the plans, they must be re-enrolled at the next statutory enrollment period. As in the U.S., employees funding defined benefit plans may need some breathing room, and the U.K. pension regulator has recognized this and has advised trustees that they may agree to allow an employer to defer its contributions for up to three months, but the trustee has to engage with the employer to determine if that deferral is really necessary and to determine when and how the employer will pay the deferred amounts. Germany has defined benefit and defined contribution plans. In order to reduce benefits or contributions, an employer would need to consult with the appropriate works council, and a works council is essentially the in-house employee representative body. If the work council doesn't agree to a change, the matter has to be discussed and negotiated in conciliation proceedings. Uh, an interesting point is that in Germany, an employer can set up a plan without adopting a funding vehicle. They can just create uh, book reserves and pay benefits as they go out of general assets. In many cases, though, an employer will set up a trust to fund benefits, perhaps at the urging of the Works Council. When employers do set up such a trust, the employer will typically pay benefits directly to participants and re be reimbursed uh, annually by the trust. What my German colleagues tell me they're seeing is that some employers are trying to speed up the reimbursement process and make it monthly rather than annual in order to improve their cash situation. Germany granted employers in financial distress an extension to pay their March, April, and May Social Security contributions for all branches of German social insurance, which would include retirement and health. The expectation is that these employers will then make up those payments beginning in June, either in a lump sum or in up to 12 installments. In France, the ability to modify the terms of a retirement program are very limited. Most retirement programs are state or mandatory ones. There are private additional supplemental retirement plans, but they're usually set up by way of collective bargaining agreements, and so a change would have to be renegotiated with the union or with employee representatives. In Brazil, uh, there's a large public pension system as well as voluntary private ones. Under private pension plans, 
An employer may only reduce future accruals by mutual agreement with its high-paid employees, and in the case of low-paid employees, must provide an equivalent replacement benefit. Hong Kong has a mandatory occupational pension scheme called the Mandatory Provident Fund Scheme, and that scheme is in the form of personal defined contribution accounts for each employee. Employers are required to contribute 5% of the relevant income of the, of the employee. Since this is a statutorily prescribed contribution level, employers aren't free to amend the plan to reduce those contributions. Besides cost containment, another issue has been financial assistance to employees affected by COVID. And in the U.S. CARES Act, we saw new legislation that permits individuals affected by COVID to take early distribution from some categories of retirement plans of up to $100,000, even though they're still employed. And these distributions are subject to fairly favorable tax treatment. A number of our clients have chosen not to adopt these provisions. They were voluntary with the employer. Uh, and I think the reason that they're not adopting them is because they don't feel that these early distributions comport with sound retirement policy, or in some cases, the employers were not happy with the way the third-party administrators would have implemented the provisions. I would add, in general, in the non-U.S. countries that we're discussing today, we have not seen liberalized distribution rules, again, because there's a commitment to sound, sound retirement policy and preserving the assets for retirement. Um, as I mentioned, um, compliance is, is or should be an important consideration for employees, but it can be very challenging in the time of COVID. In recognition of this in the U.S., the regulatory agencies have relaxed the deadlines for certain compliance matters. For example, when it comes to notice and disclosure requirements applicable to employers, the deadlines have been extended for meeting those requirements. In addition, in recognition of difficulties participants may have, the deadlines for participants and beneficiaries to file claims for benefits or to appeal denials of benefits have been greatly extended. And these um, extensions of deadlines for both employers and participants apply not only to retirement plans, but also to health and welfare plans. On health and welfare, I would like to touch uh, base briefly and note that in addition to those relaxed deadlines, there have been numerous, numerous legislation and regulatory measures adopted uh, with respect to health care. The unifying themes of those changes tend to be encouraging COVID testing as well as encouraging tel telemedicine, which of course helps with social distancing. And perhaps more, most importantly, to enhance the probability that employees will be ac have access to continuing health care even if their employment status or other personal circumstances change. And in the U.S., we have something called COBRA. If you lose your job, you can elect continuing health care under COBRA. And these measures that have been adopted delay the deadlines for employees to elect COBRA or to pay COBRA premiums. Um, we don't have time to review all the changes today but what, or to review the changes in detail, but I'd like to mention that in the U.S., our benefits group will be having a webinar in a few weeks to discuss in more detail the various COVID-related changes in the health and welfare and retirement areas. Please stay tuned for the invitation, and I hope you'll join us. And now I'll turn it over to Liz. Hello. Thank you, Maureen. I am Liz Espen Stern. I head Mayor Brown's Global Mobility and Migration Practice and I am also a co-leader of our firm's Back to Business Initiative. As my fellow speakers have emphasized, at this time of rapidly changing norms, we know how important it is for companies to establish a framework that is holistic and adaptable to the phases of reopening um, of the global business community. One key facet that employers need to focus on is management, management of the mobile work core. Employees and executives who had, until COVID, shut down travel and borders, moved across locations fluidly to address global business needs. We have identified 10 key issues that employers must be sensitive to in the first 100 days of the reopening of business across the globe five of which 
we will address today, and five, and the remaining five of which we will address in a separate session on global mobility in June. Let's begin with the first five issues. Number one, the impact of travel restrictions for visa holders is particularly potent. If a visa holder in any country is stuck and has been stuck during shelter in place, border closures, emergency actions by government, that individual may be facing a visa expiration that no longer allows them to work in that country past a certain day. This will create significant issues unless the company is apprised of and can take advantage of specific practices to extend that status. Those specific practices may include policies for um, change of status to tourist status, but in that case, work authorization does not continue, or emergency policies that the government may have provided that automatically extend or with a particular submission or registration allow that individual employee or executive to gain temporary extended work authorization status. It's absolutely critical to understand those. For individuals also that are foreign to the jurisdiction they're in, um, who are um, thinking about a move, for them also, their plans may have changed. One example is if a family was planning to relocate to a particular country to begin the school year in August or September, that family may need to revisit their plans. And the employer should be looking at relocation policies and policies for such, such change and how it will manage those. The second key issue in global mobility is really the cascading effect of tax and regulatory issues when employees were, because of COVID, or continue to be, because of COVID, stranded in a foreign jurisdiction. For example, there may be employees who traveled normally as part of a normal business travel or even a tourist travel to a particular country to visit and got stuck exactly when the borders shut down. When the Schengen area, for example, was no longer allowed to enter, uh, re-enter the United States, at that point, there could be individuals who just got stuck and didn't intend to get stuck. But if they are not nationals of the country that they got stuck in, if they're in a different country, there are tax liabilities, including potential tax liabilities for the company where the company might risk forming a permanent establishment because the employee is, for example, a high-level executive that has now been stuck in that, in that particular country and continued to work. The cleanup and alignment of those issues is absolutely critical. The third issue are requirements to update the registration, or the work permission of mobile worker, workers who did not shift locations um, from one country to another, but who may have moved from a office work site to a remote location. That is an absolutely important issue to manage. If on top of that, salary conditions, hours, schedules have been changed because of measures the employer has taken, that also will require and could possibly comprom compromise the visa status, so it needs to be reviewed. The fourth, fourth issue is the processes that employers have followed during COVID shelter at home provisions to validate the legal right to work of new employees that still onboarded during that period or to renew the right to work validation for employees whose validation had now expired. And in those instances, the employer may have followed a virtual process, or it may have used a 
um, an agent, a find a friend agent from the from the household if the individuals were remaining at home and the offices were closed. What is really critical now as business reopens is for employers to be aware of whether they need to now conduct an in-person process before the compliance file for that is completely uh, appropriate, and two, whether they can track what they actually did during that period. The fifth and final issue I want to mention today, and I'll mention it very briefly and go into it more in our next webinar, is really the diligence and planning around visa holders as major business changes begin. Whether the major business change is an acquisition, the company that may have become a target during this period, or divestitures, or a major reduction in force, in any of those major business changes, visas and work permits may change. They may not be fluid anymore. That needs to be prepared for in advance to address that mobile workforce and avoid liability. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to our next session where we can further discuss how decision-making remains agile and nimble and communications remain strong during all of these instances and wish you well in the, conduct, in the conducting of your business during this extraordinary period. And I'll turn it over to Nick to close our session. So uh, that concludes uh, this webinar. Thank you very much for making the time to listen to it. We hope you found it useful. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, do keep a lookout for the other webinars, the national webinars that we've mentioned um, during this particular um, episode, um, the series that we will be doing to follow up on the detail um, of some of the issues we've trailed here, and also some of the practical thinking that goes around addressing return to work issues or continuing to work in uh, the new normal, if you can call it that. Um, overall, um, reminder on the um, dedicated portal, their brand's dedicated portal, responding to COVID-19, which has got a whole host of materials up there that have been generated by the firm all the practice areas, addressing issues relevant to clients of the firm in specific areas. And also keep a lookout too for the 1000 initiative, which uh, translates as 10 things employers should be thinking about in the first 100 days, um, where we will be um, looking at some of those issues and some of the thinking that employers and businesses are going to have to do in the next 100 days. If you would be interested in, in a national webinar about a country that's not on the list of um, countries that we're proposing to cover off, do get in touch. We have a network of best friends worldwide, and um, we would be happy to partner with them if there was sufficient demand for a webinar on a particular country that, that we weren't currently offering to cover. Uh, and in general terms, if you've got any questions, do send them in. And we will endeavor to come back to everyone um, on all the questions um, because um, in that way we will, we will learn what people are actually interested in and um, thinking about. And from our point of view as well, we will have the additional experience that we're able to what, pass on to um, respond to questions. So there we go. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope everyone stays safe. Bye. Thank you for listening. We hope you found this useful. This series forms part of Mayor Brown's 10 Hundred series, providing guidance into the top 10 pivotal issues across various topics that businesses need to be mindful of in the first 100 days of returning to work. If you have any questions, please get in touch with any of the speakers or your usual contact at Mayor Brown, and we will be happy to follow up with you directly. For the latest COVID-19 related legal developments, please do visit our dedicated portal called Responding to COVID-19, which is available through the Mayor Brown website.